thus far this semester in torts, we have focused on several different kinds of torts. We focused on intentional torts and negligence and premises liability. Those are the our three big overarching categories that we focused on. And now we're getting into how you can provide a defense if somebody accuses you of committing a tort. And the first category of defenses that we're going to focus on is the plaintiff's conduct, meaning what did the plaintiff do that makes it so that the defendant shouldn't be liable or at least as liable. And we're going to start off with contributory negligence and then we're going to focus or rather move into comparative negligence and I'll just give an overview of comparative negligence today and go more in depth in it next week. So what is contributory negligence? Well, we have a case here, Butterfield versus Forrester. Uh, the defendant in this case had put a beam in the road, and it was negligent in putting a beam in the road, but the plaintiff was riding his horse too fast, way too fast, and ended up colliding with that beam. And so because of the plaintiff's negligence, we're saying that the defendant can't be liable for the plaintiff's contribution to that injury. And that's really where contributionary negligence comes into play. So what is com contributionary negligence? Well, first of all, it's a complete defense against the negligence of the defendant, meaning it negates all of the defendant's liability. It's an affirmative defense, which means that the defendant needs to make the defense at the beginning of litigation. Why do we have this defense? Well, the reason why we have it is to prevent plaintiffs from coming into a courtroom with quote-unquote dirty hands or rather having done wrong and they're hoping to be righted despite having done wrong and so we're trying to dissuade plaintiffs from doing wrong and getting benefits for their wrongdoing. Contributing ne tr contributory negligence is rarely used anymore. There's only four states that actually completely negate the defendant's negligence based off of this principle. Instead, most states are actually going to follow a comparative approach. And all that does is that it just lessens the damages that the plaintiff can collect. Uh, other things to consider is that comparative negligence is not a defense for intentional torts, meaning if the defendant committed a battery, then any plaintiff's actions can still be heard. Uh, the defense can be used even if the defendant is violating a statute. And then along with that, certain statutes will actually abolish uh, contributory negligence just for the purpose of that statute. We have another case here just to illustrate this principle any further is Davis v. Mann. What happened here, and it's actually not furthering the principle anymore, it's actually transitioning to a different principle. What happened here is that it was an exception to contributory negligence. Uh, the uh, defendant in this case, no, sorry, the plaintiff in this case had uh, shackled his donkey at the bottom of a road, and the defendant came up and was going too fast on the hill and ended up hitting and killing the donkey. And so the plaintiff is suing for the injury that occurred to the donkey. And the defendant says, well, hold up. It's a violation of law for that donkey to be there in the first place. You were contributorily negligent, and as a result, I can't be liable for that. And what the court says here is that if the defendant had the opportunity or rather had the last clear chance to avoid that injury well then uh, and, and continues anyways then the defendant can still be liable for that and the contributory negligence of the plaintiff doesn't even matter so think of it as if we're on a train uh, this journey that we've talked on so far we board at contributory negligence uh, we're traveling along the countryside and we stop at this last clear chance doctrine that I just talked about. And then we move on from there, and we're actually going to finish in comparative negligence. So comparative negligence is our last topic, and this is really where most states have landed on as far as the best way to handle any negligence due to the plaintiff's conduct. 
and how that can hold the defendant accountable. The reason why we have comparative negligence, just before getting into what comparative negligence is, is that we thought that contributory negligence was too hard on the plaintiff, meaning even if the plaintiff was just barely liable, well, then it completely negated the liability on the defendant. So what is comparative negligence? Well, there are two forms of it. Uh, There's a pure form and there's a modified form. The pure form is that the plaintiff can recover damages that end up being reduced by the percentage of their fault. So, for example, if the plaintiff is 90% at fault for having damages of $100,000, well, then the plaintiff can collect only $10,000 because that is how much was the defendant's fault. The defendant was liable for 10, the plaintiff was liable for 90, and so the plaintiff can only collect for what the defendant did. The modified version of this is that at some point, the plaintiff's fault is so great that they're actually barred from recovery. So for example, say the plaintiff is at 90% fault for damages of $100,000, well, the plaintiff's fault is so great that the plaintiff actually collects zero. So pure form can collect 10,000 of that 100 grand, and then the modified form can't collect anything because their fault is so great. Most jurisdictions follow this modified approach, uh, but there are, I guess, set subcategories of how modified comparative negligence works. There's 50% jurisdictions and 49% jurisdictions. What is a 50% jurisdiction? Well, all that is saying is that a plaintiff can recover if their fault does not exceed the 50% or if it's not greater than the defendant. Ultimately, what that is just saying, as long as we're below 50%, we're good to go. And in that case, then the plaintiff can recover 50% of their damages. 49% jurisdictions, however, say that the plaintiff can recover as long as their fault is not as great as or is less than the defendant's, meaning if it's a 50-50, then the plaintiff can't collect anything. But if the plaintiff's fault is at 49%, well, then they can collect for that 49%. And that's really the difference between 50% jurisdictions and 49% jurisdictions. And just to sum up everything, we've started talking about defenses, specifically the plaintiff's conduct, and then we focus on contributory negligence as a beginning point, transitioning to the last, tr- last clear chance doctrine, and finishing in comparative negligence. There's more that goes into this, but we'll focus more on that next week. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Law Schoolers. Before I let you go, there are four things I want to say. The first thing is if you enjoyed these episodes and if you enjoyed the website, I would invite you to go and join Law Schoolers Pro. And you can do that by going to lawschoolers.com slash join. It's a way for you to support us, but there's also a lot of features there that I think you will enjoy. Second thing is that nearly all of our episodes are unedited, the only ones that aren't our pre-law materials, and the reason for that is so you can actually see the legal material in its raw form as I'm learning it as well. The third thing is that the information contained in these episodes are specifically only for educational purposes. They're not to be used as legal advice, and with that, the fourth thing is if it is used as legal advice, we are not liable. That is, law schoolers is not liable for any legal outcomes. Thank you again for enjoying the show. Have a good one.